Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Greetings and welcome back to the program again today and thank you for joining us. I think we have been having a powerful, powerful series on the seven I am's of Jesus and we have dealt with six of them. Today will be the last program, I think, that I am going to deal with the I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are seven times in the scriptures, or not scriptures, but in the book of John where Jesus says, I am. Now remember the first time I am is used is when Moses said to God, and God said, let my people go. He said, who must I say sent me? He said, you tell them I am sent you. So when Jesus is declaring I am in the Gospels of John, He is identifying with His right as part of the Godhead in the deity, I am the door. I am the shepherd of the sheep. I am the light. I am I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. And every time He does that, He does it usually in contrast to what they thought was the way, or what they thought was the bread, or what they thought was the light. And almost every one of them had to do with thinking that, uh, uh, you know, for instance, when Jesus would say to them, He took them out into a wilderness and fed the multitudes. He fed the 5,000 with bread and fish. And they were full of the bread and fish. It's as if Jesus was doing a, uh, if you will, a repeat of the wilderness journey when Moses brought them out into the wilderness and fed them on the bread from heaven. And it's while Jesus has them out there in the field and He's feeding the 5,000, He said, your fathers, He says this to them while He's feeding the 5,000. He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. But I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. In other words, you thought that was the bread, and you thought Moses brought you the bread, but that's not the bread. That was only a picture. I'm the bread, the true bread that came down from heaven. You thought Moses in his law was the door into the sheepfold, but I'm telling you there's only one door, and Jesus is the door. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. You thought the shepherds of Isaiah that were there to just shear the sheep and uh, hirelings that would lead the flock of God, you thought they were the shepherds, but I'm the good shepherd. And David grabbed that and said, I, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You thought that was the shepherd, but he's the true shepherd. And the last segment we began to deal with, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we're going to pick up, and this will be the fourth segment on that. Before I do that though, you say, well you sure have piqued my interest and we are wish we would not have missed about the other, I don't know, there's been 20, probably 20 something of them. Maybe 24, I don't know, I've lost count of it here. But uh, you'd like to go back and say, well I wish I, I could have seen all of those. Let me just tell you that they are on our YouTube channel. Everything we air to date is on their archive. This will be titled, this will be a playlist titled, The Seven I Am's of Jesus. And it is there for your viewing convenience on demand. They say, well I don't have time to uh, just sit and watch YouTube, and I don't have internet for YouTube. Well, you also, if you have a iPhone or a device that can take uh, iTunes, we have a podcast on iTunes. We also, if you don't have an, uh, you know, a Apple device, we have a uh, a RSS feed for an Android device. Now the easiest way to do any of this is to simply go to my website and that information is on the screen right now. It's simply lynnhiles.com and in the upper right hand corner there are icons that will take you directly to our YouTube page or to our iTunes or to our RSS feed and you can watch them or listen to them on demand, redeem the time while you're in your car, mowing your lawn, sitting in your living room watching TV, it is available. And we do really encourage you to share them with your friends. Help us get the word out that we're on and that we're saying some things that I believe may be challenging that'll bless you. I've really been encouraged by uh, some of the comments we've received recently of the stuff that we're sharing and how 
uh, many people are really watching that we didn't really realize were watching. And that really encouraged me recently. So thank you for your cards and letters and your responses, even through email from the link on our website. We appreciate it. It does encourage us. Uh, 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 let me just get back in the Word here today, because I want again, I don't want to take a whole lot of time, but I do want to just kind of give an overview, and I've co covered this a little bit, but let me review a little bit. The, the backdrop here is that the disciples are in the upper room. This is prior to His crucifixion. It is the night before His decease, and Jesus says, with great desire have I desired to eat this Passover. The reason He wants to eat this Passover is because it's the last Passover, because this time Jesus is going to become the Passover lamb so that they will never again have to kill another lamb and sit at a table and eat lamb. The real lamb of God is now on the scene. And He's about to inaugurate a new covenant. And when He raises the cup, I don't know if we really realize how powerful this is, but when He raises the cup and says, this cup is my blood in the new covenant, what He's saying is, this one is now, this old covenant is now obsolete, and it is fading away. This lamb that you're eating, you will never have to eat again because this bread is my body that was broken for you. And He was inaugurating and toasting the Kingdom of God and a new covenant. Matter of fact, He tells them the night before His decease, I will not drink wine again until I drink it new with you in my Father's Kingdom. And in Acts chapter 2, they popped the cork on a vintage of wine that had never been drunk before, and they got drunk, not as you suppose, but they got very, very filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were full of new wine. Jesus toasted the coming of His kingdom. And if you go back and listen to last week's segment, it might blow your mind, because I dealt with some stuff in Acts chapter 1 that probably had never been put beside of John 14. Hallelujah. But in Acts chapter 2 it said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one accord in one place, and they received the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, the Kingdom of God came. He toasted the coming of the Kingdom, and the coming of the King, because He said, I will not drink wine until I drink it new with you in my Father's Kingdom. And the new wine of the Holy Ghost was the new wine of the Kingdom, and the Holy Spirit brought with it the Kingdom of God. For the Kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy, and it's located in the Holy Ghost. What we can see is then in John, where he's setting this up, and it's the night before his decease, and they're sitting at the table, and he's giving this to his disciples. I've said this almost every segment, but I need to say it again. Peter, the disciples, all of them there are going to leave him before the night's over, except for John. Peter especially jumps up and he says, Lord, I man, I'm ready to go with you. I, I, I'm ready to fight for you. I'll, I'll die for you. And Jesus said, listen, man, I know you mean that. I'm just, I'm paraphrasing, but He said, I know you think you can do this, but where I'm going right now, you cannot come. You will come later, but you're not going to right now. See, because Peter wasn't full of the Holy Ghost yet. He didn't have the strength of an indwelling Holy Ghost yet. And he looks at Pete and he says, man, listen, dude, before the rooster crows, you are going to deny me three times, thrice. And so I shared with you how that the rooster crowing was not just to rat Peter out, but if you ever know of being on a farm, when a rooster crows, it announces a new day. So what Pete, what the Lord was saying to Pete is, listen man, you, you think you can today, but you're not going to be able to do this. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. But it's, the rooster's going to crow, man, and he is going to announce a new day for you, because the new day's going to come where you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we think John 13 ends with that story, and then we put a divider there with John 14, but there's no dividers in the texts. The next words coming out of the mouth of Jesus after He tells Peter, you are going to fail, He said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. And He says, in My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. And I shared with you in prior segments how we think that place He was preparing for us was a mansion in the sky somewhere, when in reality He said that where I am you may be also. But as you get on down in John 14, just a few verses later, He tells you where I am you may be also, but He says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in Me. That's where I'm taking you, that where I am. Well, where is He? He's in the Father, and the Father is in Him. 
And I shared with you in a prior segment how that the mansion is not where you're going to live. It's where God and the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are going to live inside of you. Because that same Greek word translated mansion in John 14, 1 and 2 is the same Greek word that's only ever used one other time in the Scripture, and it's in John 14 where he says, I and my Father, we will come and we will make our abode in you. In other words, me and Dad are going to come and live with you. You're going to become the governor's mansion, so to speak. In other words, this was not about you evacuating and going to heaven, but it was about all the Father was coming to take up His abode within us. It was all about the promise of the Holy Spirit coming and not leaving us comfortless, which was the Greek word orphanos, which is the English word we translate orphan. So he's saying, listen, I am going to prepare a place for you. That place is not just a building you're going to live in, but it's going to be a place of living out of relationship with Father because that's where I am. I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. And, you know, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you and you don't know me? In other words, I came not just to bring you to know a God who's a white-haired old man on a Victorian chair with a club in his hand, ready to slap you upside the head when you fail. No, he's introducing a concept about God that's totally revolutionary, and that is the fact that he is going to be to them not just a God, but a father. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. And if I come and me and the Father take up our abode within you, what's going to happen is greater works than these are you going to do, and you're going to affect the planet, because you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea and Jerusalem and in the uttermost part of the earth. And I told you in Acts chapter 1 when he was demanded by them, uh, they asked him, uh, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? His answer to them was, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you. What he's saying is, yes, I am going to restore the kingdom to Israel, but I'm going to do it through a people full of the Holy Ghost. And in Acts chapter 2, everything Jesus promised them in John 13 and 14 came to pass because he said to them, I will not drink wine again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And in Acts chapter 2, they popped the cork on a vintage of wine that had never been drunk before, and the Holy Spirit came in, and power came, and 3,000 people were added to the church, and the new covenant was inaugurated in that Holy Spirit because now they were drinking wine new with Him in the kingdom. I don't think it's an accident that when we see the Exodus journey in the Scripture, when Moses led them up out of Egypt, they were delivered by the blood of a spotless lamb. Then they came to the Red Sea, and they're delivered by water. So they're blood-bought and water-baptized. We fast forward to the New Covenant, and Jesus is the true Lamb of God. And of course, we believe in water baptism, which, which identifies us with His death being baptized into Christ. But in the Old Testament, exactly 50 days, after they left Egypt, and they'd eaten the Passover lamb, they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, and that's where God gave them the covenant of the law. The moment God gave them the covenant of the law on Mount Sinai, 3,000 people dropped dead. In the new covenant, on the day of Pentecost, exactly 50 days after Jesus, the true Lamb of God, has been sacrificed, it's exactly 50 days later, because the word Pentecost means 50, because 50 days after Passover begins the Feast of Pentecost. And when the Feast of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place and one accord. This time, God did not give them rules on rocks. He gave them the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit is to the New Covenant what the law was to the Old Covenant. And the reason preachers won't preach the New Covenant is because they don't believe the Holy Spirit can do what the Holy Spirit said He can do, and that is He will reprove the world of sin, He will convict us of righteousness and of judgment. And I'm going to get into that just for a moment, because this is one of the things I wanted to say 
in this segment. But the Holy Spirit comes just like it did on the day of Pentecost, 50 days, and when the Holy Spirit comes, it is the symbol or the place where God gave the covenant that He wanted to have with Israel clear back when they came out of Egypt. When they came out of Egypt, God brought them out based on the Abrahamic covenant. And at the foot of Mount Sinai, the only requirement of the Abrahamic covenant was faith, that you believe. But when they came to the foot of Mount Sinai, and the people came out, and God came down on the mountain, God was excited. He said, I'm going to make a whole nation of priests out of them. You're going to be to me a chosen people. You're going to be to me a priesthood, a whole nation of priests. I'm going to have personal relationship with every one of you. Here's what happened. But the people began to murmur in their tents and said, we're afraid of him, Moses. You go talk to him and whatever He says to you, do it. And the people forfeited a personal relationship with God for a mediator system. Galatians, I believe it is, chapter 3 says, the law was added because of a transgression. The transgression was they failed to believe God and they transgressed the Abrahamic covenant and they forfeited a personal relationship with God based on faith for a rules on rocks relationship. But see, here's what happens. If you don't have relationship, you got to have rules. But God wanted to restore them back to relationship where it wasn't about rules, it would be about an indwelling Holy Spirit. And Peter gets a hold of this concept and he writes it in the New Testament because God brings us all the way back around to what God wanted to do at the foot of Mount Sinai, and that was to make a nation of priests. But Jesus says concerning New Testament, but believers in the first century, but you are a chosen generation, and a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. God brought them back into a personal relationship where they could be governed by the Holy Spirit, because the longer these people didn't have relationship, the more rules they had to have, and they started living by laws instead of living out of the life and the divine supply and they forfeited their relationship with God. Now Jesus is bringing us back into a relationship where God is not just my distant God or my punisher, but He's my Father. He's Abba. And He's not just full of demand, but He brings the supply of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, that begins to, to, to do the work inside of me that says greater works than these will you do. Now let me just take you in here as I bring my notes back up for a moment, because I wanted to get a few scriptures in this that, that I think will uh, bless you. First of all, I wanted to say to you that the first thing the Holy Spirit does is confirm your sonship. Because He says, I will not leave you, in John 14, I will not leave you comfortless. The word comfortless there is orphanos, I will not leave you as orphans. So in the Old Covenant you were servants, in the New Covenant your sons. And if you're sons, then you're heirs of God and you live this life in context of sonship. And that's what eternal life really is, is that you would know the Father. The second thing He does is He gives you, the Bible says, uh, uh, I will send you another comforter. And that word for comforter is the Greek word paraclete. And this word is a word that means a calling to one side, a consoler, to comfort, or literally exhortation. It also means to be defense counsel. It means to be a like paraclete, like a, a, a legal consultation, not a prosecutor, but literally a defense counsel. And uh, Jesus said, one that comes alongside of you, and, and uh, Jesus said, when this paraclete comes, he will remind you, He will bring to remembrance, He says, verse 16, and I will, this is John 14, verse 16, I will pray the Father, and He will give you another comforter. He will give you a paraclete, that He may abide with you forever. He's going to give you something that's going to be with you always. And then in verse 26, He says, but the comforter, the paraclete, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So what the Holy Spirit does is remind you it can only testify 
of what Jesus already taught you. Uh, verse uh, John 15, 26 says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So he said, I'm going to give you another Comforter. I'm going to give you the paraclete. But all this paraclete can do is he's going to bring to your members all things that I have taught you. And the only thing he will come into agreement with is what I have taught you. And I, this really blessed me as I got to thinking about this. So many times we will get in our mully grubs and get down in the dumps and we'll go, boy, what a loser I am. I'm just a no good, dirty, rotten sinner. And your paraclete goes, I can't agree with that. I can only tell you what Jesus said about you. Yeah, but I'm sick and I'm depressed and I'm discouraged. Yeah, but I can't come into agreement with that. I'm not coming to your pity party because that's not what Jesus taught you. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I can only tell you what's true about you. And the Holy Spirit begins to try to get you to come into agreement because if two of you can agree on earth as touching something, it'll be done. You need to start agreeing with what your paraclete is saying about you. You are not guilty. You are not a sinner. You're not ungodly. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now see, he says, uses this same Greek word in one of the epistles that John wrote. He says, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word advocate there is the Greek word paraclete. Hallelujah. He's in your corner. He's not the prosecuting attorney. He is defense counsel. And all he can tell you is when they say, do you want to enter a plea? You tell them, I plead the blood of Jesus. If the judge asks you, do you want to make a confession? You say, absolutely. I want to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and tell you that I believe God raised him from the dead. And you will receive a verdict of not guilty. Because if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. And your attorney takes the floor to plead your case on all of these uh, issues. Now I want to show you one other thing here before we run out of time. John 16 verse 7 tells you about the work of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7 through 13 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, the Paraclete, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not. The first work of the Holy Spirit is to convince unbelievers of sin so that they realize, I need a Savior. So the Holy Spirit dealt with my heart years ago and convinced me and convicted me of sin because I was not a believer. But once I become a believer, the next thing the Holy Spirit does, and this is something we hardly ever hear anybody preach, then the second work of the Holy Spirit is to convict and convince us of righteousness because I go to the Father. Now what the paraclete is trying to do is show you that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not on the basis of what you've done, but on the basis of what He's done, and that your righteousness is not based on old covenant performance, because that's not the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the I am we're on right now. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And all he can do is testify if what is true of you because of what Jesus did in his redemptive work and to convince you that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now I'm convinced that once you mix that with faith and you believe it, the just will live by faith. In other words, if you believe your righteousness, you're righteous, you're going to act like you're righteous. Your identity is not just something you walk around and spout out without ever demonstrating that. When you really believe it, you will act like you're the righteousness of God. But when you sin, he doesn't come back and say, see there, you loser, you sinner, you no good for nothing, dirty, rotten, scoundrel. No, he picks you back up, dusts you back off and says, that's not who you are. You're the righteousness of God. I can only testify of what Jesus said concerning you. That's what your paraclete does. 
That's what he says. And as a matter of fact, in one place where he says that, you know, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. The word if you confess there is, is a, a Greek word that means if you'll say the same thing about that he said. And if he says you're righteous, then bless God, you're righteous. If he says you are uh, 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 holy, then you're holy. That's what the paraclete comes to constantly remind you so that you are uh, uh, realizing that you're the righteousness of God. The third thing that the Holy Spirit does is convinces and convicts you of judgment because the prince of this world is already judged, is what Jesus says in John number, uh, this is John 16, verse number 13. And uh, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will convince you that as a believer, your paraclete is saying, your judgment is not in your future, it's in your past. Because Jesus drew all judgment into himself when he was on the cross. And I'm going to tell you one thing that really encouraged me. He says, well, we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, the good news is it's a seat. Because the book of Hebrews says that every priest standeth daily, sometimes offering the same sacrifices for sins day after day. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. So the fact that he's seated means your sin has been taken care of, and as a believer, you can have boldness that on the day of judgment, as He is, so are we in this present world, and that your judgment is not in your future. For believers, your judgment is in your past. For those who are not believers, the Scripture says, the wrath of God abides on the unbelieving. And so he writes these things saying, I am, that believing you might have life through His name. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's the sixth I am that Jesus said, and I hope that's ministered to you. He's the way to God, He's the truth, He's the life, and He's what brings us into this relationship, Father-Son relationship. Thank you for joining us again this week. Join us as we uh, unpack the next one next week. I am the true vine. I believe you're going to be blessed. If you'd like to sow a seed into this ministry to help us to be able to take the gospel around the world, we appreciate your help. Do that by going to our website. There's a link there where you can give via credit card, PayPal, or, uh, or, or debit card. And you can even sign up there and give a monthly recurring de debit if you'd like to become a monthly partner. You can also write a check or money order and send it to the address that will come on the screen. It will help us greatly to take the gospel around the world. We do appreciate you. We believe in you. Thank you for telling your friends about us. Join in again next week at the same time as we continue talking about what Jesus said, I am. He is the I am for sure. God bless. The word repentance means to change your mind. The message of John the Baptist and of Jesus was to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is accessed by a change in our thinking. If you are in outer darkness, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That reality is not always out in the distant future. It is in people's lives right now. One simple mind shift can move you out of darkness and weeping and into light and rejoicing. God wants to wipe all tears from our eyes and replace our weeping with joy.